Hi, Ravi and Kathy. How are you? Hi, Lakshmi. Like so today we are here to talk about the myth of the entrepreneur. Is entrepreneur a myth, or is there a myth behind the entrepreneur, or is there a myth of the entrepreneur? Or tell us a little bit about what this book is about. That's that's a great question, Lakshmi. So you know we. We chose this title because in, in the first half of the book, we go through Ravi's story as an entrepreneur, how he built these amazing businesses throughout his life, throughout three generations in Mumbai, in Hyderabad, all across the world, really. Uh, and then in the second part of the book, it's titled Myth of the Entrepreneur, and we go into you know why this very successful entrepreneur actually took a major pause in his life and rethought all of the things that it meant about being an entrepreneur and changed significantly the way that he operated and structured his new set of businesses under a trusteeship structure where most of the profits over 90 percent are distributed to uh, a charitable trust from the beginning where you know giving and shared wealth is in the very dna of the business so we mm -hmm. track this journey personally and we also talk a lot about you know uh, how an entrepreneur himself living the life of an entrepreneur kind of wakes up to this myth and realizes, you know, there's much more to this uh, that I can do. And there's, there's, there's a stand that I really need to take. So basically you're saying there is a myth about being an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, I want to shift to Ravi a little bit in terms of this, to write this uh, Ravi, you know, your own journey as an entrepreneur has been kind of instrumental in this. And there is a, reawakening in within you that led to this conversation. So tell us a little bit about what is it that led you to even this thinking about uh, the myth of the entrepreneur and uh, going on the journey before the book? Well, this is a very unlikely uh, project for me because yeah. by nature, I'm a very private person. And I went from uh, just a few months ago to yeah. being completely under the radar to yeah. uh, share intimate story and a lot of a lot of my journey mm -hmm. so it but i thought it was i thought it was important and mm -hmm. kathy had a big hand in pushing me towards uh -huh. it uh, yeah maybe the reason for this is, uh, uh, i remember when i was growing up my father used to tell a lot of stories and he used mm -hmm. to talk about his past his own thoughts his philosophy what he was doing and he died about five years ago and mm -hmm. after that one of the things that i really uh, missed was having this connection to these stories uh, mm -hmm. and my children are very young uh, and they're, they're just mm -hmm. in their teens now early teens mm -hmm. and uh, i thought that it would be a good idea to record my own thoughts and mm -hmm. uh, uh, record some of the history that i remember from what my father told me, what my grandfather told me about mm -hmm. the context within which we grew up and also some of the uh, philosophical and business choices that we made mm -hmm. that uh, brought us to where we are. And this also has a big impact. The way that uh, we have set up our life had an, has an impact on my kids. And they were mm -hmm. young enough. Uh, I don't, didn't know that they would understand if I explained it then. And plus, memories also fade. Yeah. So in fact, uh, the origin that a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, Kathy was uh, at studying at Oxford. She had come down from Colombia for a year here at Oxford. And yeah. I was looking for somebody to help me to do an oral history project. And yeah. so she interviewed the uh, interviews for a few months or, or 10 or 12 hours. And, uh, and, it, and at, the end, at the end of that process, uh, I think uh, it, it started coming out that it was something that's worth sharing or there's, there's some elements here worth sharing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I yeah. uh, Ravi at that time, he used to always look at me and he would say, I've never told so many things to one person before. And he was really yeah. very shy. About it. Um, but, you know, we, we tracked almost three generations from his, you know, grandfather, his father, himself, even his children, business vision, philosophy, you know, his meditation period. And uh, I realized that this was an entrepreneur who was not just someone who had built incredibly successful scaled businesses, but someone who had put a lot of time and thinking into why is the world the way it is? What is my role in relation to society as an entrepreneur? Uh, what yeah. is the thing of creating value? Some fundamental uh, philosophical and social questions. So we engaged on a lot of those questions and we debated. I mean, I was a philosophy student. Um, I had absolutely no interaction with entrepreneurs before this. Rugby was probably yeah. the first entrepreneur I had ever met or spoken to. So it was yeah. a radically 
know, different perspectives. And we yeah. had a lot of healthy debate around, you know, those core topics. And I, I approached Ravi and I was like, look, this is a story that I think not only your family should hear, but this is something that can shed light on a lot of people's life journeys and, and the way that they look at how to contribute to society. So there might be a big yeah. project here. And also, I mean, it's always interesting that we always talk about being logical and saying that I will do this for this many years and this like life's a plan. And then the most significant things we do in life happen because of an emotional incident, you know, like when somebody you're very close, you lose somebody very close or you lose your favorite job or, you know, whatever it is, you know, when some huge loss happens. Uh, that's when some of the most significant decisions happen. So I think, uh, I mean, I always think even for me, even to come to India, whatever has a lot to do with my dad passing away and thinking that, oh my God, you know, what am I doing? So I think it's, thank you for sharing that, uh, Ravi. I think it's important to uh, use the, uh, you know, the changing points in our life for something positive that can go out to a lot of people. And continuing on that, because one of the things you, you know, one of the things that comes out a lot is in terms of um, dealing with inequality of outcomes. I mean, in the sense that uh, all of us may be just as smart as the person living down the street or vice versa. But sometimes some success may have come just because we are lucky to be where we are, not necessarily we are smarter than anybody else or uh, better than anybody else. So it'd be great if you can talk a little bit about, because it's a central to your book in terms of uh, how to deal with inequality of outcomes and also how to create entrepreneurship that can bring more equality into the world. So maybe let's talk about the concept of inequality of outcomes a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when, when we framed the book, we really saw uh, the world is going through this uh, this crisis, right? If you look around the world, if you look at the U.S., you look at uh, political movements right now in France, you look at what's happening in Europe, you look at what's happening in Asia, uh, there's a real social crisis that people feel like uh, the kind of liberal democracy that everyone thought would bring um uh, welfare to all is breaking apart. And this is because multinational companies, uh, individual entrepreneurs, and you know, the top 1% that we hear about so much in the press uh, owns, you know, over 50% of the world's wealth. And the rest of the 7 billion, we kind of share, you know, what is what is left. And how did capitalism and democracy create this reality, which now many people are fighting against and many people uh, see as unfair. So we know that, you know, Socially, this is happening at a global scale. Uh, so when we look into the inequality of outcomes, we're really looking at the very broad distribution of wealth in the world, and obviously also in an Indian context, right? In India, it's something like the top 1% owns over 70% of the wealth. It's even more uh, concentrated in a developing economy uh, with a massive population where we really need to get key resources to more people in order to kickstart the kind of growth that we want to see in the country. And Ravi has a lot of thoughts as well about how much wealth is going to be created in India in the next 15 years. How is that going to be distributed? What different realities are going to be created uh, if, if we allow this to continue? So, mm -hmm. you know, broadly we look at kind of like globally what's happening in inequality and wealth distribution. We look at the trickle down effects of that, right? What does that mean on education? Because what happens is inequality is a is a is a positive feedback loop. Inequality creates more inequality because it yeah. happens that the people who have the resources then also have the massive edge in terms of uh, education, in terms of other resources, in terms of network, and then it essentially compounds itself. So we look at this story of Venice, right, and 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 the La Serraza, this period in Venice's history where it went from being one of the most vibrant economies in the world to essentially becoming completely closed off uh, because the inequality had spread so much that it started essentially choking off the growth of the place because then you have a lot of entrenched interests trying to push their own agenda and not necessarily doing something that's positive for growth. So we want to make two points. One is that inequality is massive right now uh, in terms of wealth distribution across the world. This is something that's widely discussed uh, across academic and, and political goals. The second thing is that inequality creates more inequality of outcomes. And the third thing is that, you know, after a certain threshold of inequality of outcomes, uh, everyone's outcome is actually worse. Uh, so yeah. how do we a stop to this self-destructive cycle is something. So if I, were, if I were to put a specifically an India 
angle to it, Ravi, so because of your experience growing up here, uh, etc., and being out there also, you know, enjoy, enjoying both the, the kind, you know, situation, etc. In what way did your own personal experience or uh, uh, contribute to addressing this issue here? Is it that at some point there was an aha moment for you, or what happened? for you that you have seen here that made you want to address this in a big way? I, I mean, I, you're right. I, growing up in India, uh, it is very stark or most of all the points that Cathy was talking about inequality, they are more Correct. visible. But Correct. the more I live in other parts of the world, I find that it is almost equally similar in other places too. Correct. Uh, yeah. And I, I would say for me, yeah, I don't know about an aha moment, but certainly there's an aha period. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So what was so your aha period? <laughs> I, I spent, I mean, I spent the early part of my business life or career trying to build businesses more as sort of an art form, in the sense Correct. that I would identify an opportunity and find some solution, execute it well, uh, find an elegant way to do things, uh, create equity. And I thought that that was, that was about as much as one could do. Yeah. Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that uh, we're missing out some of the larger pieces. I mean, we're addressing some parts of being an entrepreneur, but we are not addressing much larger pieces out there. Correct. So one of the things that uh, I started questioning was that just because the way that equity is, equity is designed this way or the companies are designed this way, and this has happened for hundreds of years, and those who wish to engage in society, sponsors or promoters or, or at the end of their life or the end of a company's life or at some arbitrary time, they mm -hmm. decide to address the philanthropic or the more social angle. But there is also there are other methods where you build this into your DNA. You build this into how companies are designed right from the get-go rather than it being an afterthought. So Correct. there was, I mean, I, I did spend years between uh, two sets of companies, shall we say, yeah. thinking about this question. Yeah, and just like Lakshmi said, you know, a lot of these things are, are forced pauses right. or forced revelations. So right. maybe you can Correct. tell us a little bit about the start of the book and what happened. Yeah. So I, I was living in 2003 and 2004. I'd been there for about seven, seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was fairly healthy. I was uh, running, I mean, they even trained to run a marathon then. I was doing a lot of hiking. I thought I was reasonably healthy, but I did have a health scare and I, and, uh, I was in a hospital for three or four days mm -hmm. and it, it forced me to uh, sit quietly yeah. and think about, uh, think, I mean, just like you mentioned, you know, right, yeah. so it, it, it was opportunity to reflect and, right. and question some of the things that we uh, took for granted. Yeah. Correct. Well, one of the things Correct. I always love about Russell this is what he preaches, you know, he yeah. spent those four days in the IC. And after that, within six months, he exited three of the active businesses he was running. And he said, I'm not going to do anything until yeah. I figure out what the meaning is. Like, what's my yeah. relationship to great body? And then, yeah. you know, he spent five years traveling the world, spending a lot of time on meditation, you know, going back to his family home in Hyderabad and just sitting and thinking and saying, you know, I, I cannot start again until I really find an answer mm -hmm. to this. You know, it's always interesting to me. We always operate as though life should be measured in quarters. You know, like, what did I do this quarter? What did I do this month? But if you think about it, you know, all of us are going to live longer, whether we like it or not. And uh, let's say you live to be 70, 80, whatever, 60, doesn't matter, some number. If you take five years, it's a very small chunk of that time, you know. I mean, in the sense, if you can really think through and make something that can impact the rest of your life, then that's not a huge number. But all, we always feel that, oh my God, like one year is past. I haven't done anything. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think that's where maybe you should talk a little bit about Vipassana. You know, when you go somewhere and sit for 10 days, not talk to anybody, uh, maybe it puts things in perspective to say, it's okay. You know, so did, uh, what kind of influence did Vipassana have on you, Ravi? Well, it was transformative for me. I think yeah. it was one of the key 
methods or the, or the key reasons why I was able to reflect and think a little longer. But I think it could be different for us. For different yeah, people. absolutely. No, I'm only asking you for you what it was. You know, it's sort of, it's not a blanket answer for everybody. It's sort of. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was transformative and it, it did, it did allow me, as you said, that when you don't have inputs for a long time, other than yeah. Meditation, just the fact that you're not dealing with the nitty gritty of life every day. Yeah. Uh, it does allow you to think a lot more and question some of your basic assumptions. Yeah. And the more I question them, the more I realize that although I was I, in, in uh, I would say, reasonably successful in my mind. Correct. But, uh, I realized that I had all the wrong metrics to determine success. Yeah. Uh, or determine whether I was doing and what the next part of life should be. What yeah. my relationship should be with my family, my dear yeah. friends, with businesses, yeah. with investors. So, yeah. so I mean, my last. About- I was just going to say my last question to both of you about the book because the rest I want people to read the book and not get it from this. Is part of the title of the book is searching for real value, right? So maybe the both of you can talk a little bit about what is the real value of being an entrepreneur. I mean, just give a peek into the book, not the whole book, because mm-hmm. otherwise, you know. People think they got a sense of everything. They got to buy the book to read more. So <laughs> just kidding. So just tell me from each of your perspective, what do you feel is the real value of uh, contributing through a capitalistic entrepreneurial journey? Mm. Okay. I, I think that, I think that when we said a search for true value, we meant it on two levels. Firstly is Rubby's story and how he searched for true sure. value. So like he said, he went from being an entrepreneur who had his own artistic process, who really, you know, was radical in the way he was doing business, but maybe was not thinking about why he was doing business, right? Got it. And I think as he was forced into this pause and went through meditation and went through these things that force you to face those first principles, he realized that the true value of, of an entrepreneur is to create collective value. That all these stories we hear these days about this, we focus a lot on entrepreneurs as individuals, right? Uh, right. This entrepreneur and story and he created this and this is and this is his and so that's why he's so wealthy etc and successful and powerful um, and I think we really take the philosophy of meditation a lot of meditation is about decentering the ego is about saying you know it's not about me or I you know this self that we hold on to so much actually changes constantly and you know it is not the we should not use the self to direct our lives and uh, even if you look at the founding of Mitra uh, Ravi's currently chairman of the Mitra group it's a company where the majority beneficial shareholder is a trust right and and that kind of is in some ways the way uh, you can look at it as a mirror right like Mm -hmm. Vipassana tells you how to spiritually and psychologically decenter your ego and the structure of Mitra is kind of taking the individual entrepreneur out of the business as like you know the major face or the major beneficiary Saying that it's becoming a much more collective process. So Vipassana and meditation teaches you to look at the world with a more collective purpose, to identify with you know, with humanity, with all of life. And I think the way that the trusteeship structure works is being able to take out the, the entrepreneur as the main beneficiary and have it be you know a collective. So mm-hmm. trusteeship was something that's been championed since Gandhian times. And, and the philosophy is really, you know, look, like uh, for business people, you have this extra something, you know, that makes you able to create uh, amazing things at scale. Uh, but but that doesn't mean that all of the fruits of that labor are just for you, right? right. You should right. take is kind of your substance, but the rest of it should be shared wealth with the collective right. because that's the meaning of life and that's, you know, how we build a flourishing society. Okay. Yeah, this so, is, this, this, so sorry. Sorry, Ravi, uh, just to add to that, I would like you to say this has been a kind of a process for you, right? First of all, to talk about things you're not used to talk about and uh, uh, to, you know, thinking of details of things you haven't done in a while, etc. After you answer this question as a continuation, I would like to say what true value did this process bring to you as a person? Uh, that's an excellent question. So, uh, I mean, to continue what Kathy was saying, yeah. When we say search for true value, as and as you said also that because when you have a forced pause, you start thinking about this and that, or thinking about other layers and other meanings. But I think that we this fork is always there in our lives. It's Correct. just that when we stop, yeah. we look at it. Mm-hmm. There are multiple ways to deal with it. I mean, I think all uh, either you can 
prepare the car while it's in motion. You can think of yeah. it a little bit incremental. But yeah. uh, I think we all have the option. Oh, many many of, us, uh, of, of us have the option to stop completely and then restart again. And because the first part of our life, for, for most people, is to inertia. You finish college, uh, you get your first job or your professional career, and you, you do a little bit because you're doing yeah. basic things. You're you're paying your bills. You're trying to de- you're trying to find out who you are yourself and what you're mm-hmm. capable of. But yeah. uh, most people continue. Uh, I mean, it's very hard. To, to make any big change there. Mm-hmm. But I think that uh, everybody should, and I, and I believe with, with hindsight, I should have thought about this a lot earlier, that we should question assumptions of what is value? Mm-hmm. What, is it that, what is it that we are spending so much of our time and effort on? Uh, and uh, what is it that, what, what, I mean, uh, as, as we are saying, the myth of the entrepreneur, I mean, yeah. value. Not necessarily simply building a business or simply creating jobs. I think it doesn't stop there. Correct. And I, you know, I keep saying that today somehow the world of entrepreneurship has become about valuations instead of values. You know, so it's sort of what values do you want to put out there? What values do you live by? Because at the end of the day, you know, there's only whatever six square foot. In my case, five square foot, whatever. You know, or maybe ashes take even less. So. You hardly occupy anything in this earth at the end. So what's your journey about? And that's why I think it's great, uh, Ravi, you're sharing about the value it had for you. Uh, And I think it'd be wonderful for a lot of the people to read the book and learn about your journey and see where your moments were and how you actually turned an idea into an action. So it's sort of like, uh, yes, it's about uh, trusteeship, but but you actually went out and created a company that actually implemented that. So it's not just about ideas, but how do you implement the ideas? And I'm sure the readers are going to find how to do that. Um, I want to shift a little bit to the process itself of writing this book, um, mm-hmm. you know, of two completely different people coming together, uh, you know, a, a philosophy major and a business person um, from two different cultures, two different businesses mm-hmm. coming together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course you look like twins, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, what was the, I, I mean, collaboration process like, you know, because I'm very interested in understanding, because I truly believe that in world, great things happen if we can collaborate with people, but it's also more difficult because, you know, the minute there are variables, it's also difficult. So it's sort of telling me a little bit about maybe, the best part of collaborating and the toughest part of collaborating uh, for both of, for each of you. Maybe one can talk about the best and one can about the, <laughs> the tough. <laughs> Maybe we have different ones for those. Uh, but but I, absolutely, I think it's also good to, to, to talk a little bit about how this collaboration came to be. Yeah. Like I said, this oral history project, and I really mentioned offhand to Ruby, like, look, this story deserves to be told. But he was the one who approached me and said, what do you think about working together on a book? And and I really respected Ruby for that. And I even asked him, I was like, look, we come from completely different backgrounds. I was like, I have no track record in writing a text of that scale. You know, you could hire any person to collaborate with you who might be a professor of business or entrepreneurship or someone who's just way more polished in what they do. And one of the things that Ruby told me was, you know, I would like to write this book with you because in our conversation and kind of surrounding debates we had while we were doing the oral history, he was like, you know, he was like, what he said was, I'm always considered, I'm speaking from Ruby, like, like, Ruby's always considered a radical, you know, amongst his peers. And he was like, what I liked when conversing with you is that you were the radical and I was the conservative. <laughs> and he was saying that he wanted a voice that was pushing it, the conversation even further, right? Someone who is at a completely different end of life, who's looking towards the future as something that, you know, is so expansive and, and has so many possibilities that we can consider truly radical outcomes. And mm-hmm. I thought it was very, very brave. Because at the end of the day, you know, this book is very much uh, also a, a personal legacy. And I thought that it was mm. it was extremely brave for someone to actually say, I will put that in the hands of someone who is so young, who is so different from me and trust her with my story that she'll do it justice, but also that she needs to put her own perspective into it. So I, I, I highly respected that. Uh, the other thing was, you know, when we first started working on the book, We brought together a bunch of researchers from different backgrounds, people who are studying, you know, uh, economics, theology, uh, history. And we said, you know, let's get together a bunch of ideas around, you know, 
uh, what is entrepreneurship historically, uh, what is the diagnosis we have now on things that are wrong in society, how can we come up with solutions. And Ravi, like the private man that he is, was like, you know, first version of the book was no personal story. None. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, it was like, it was like text argument you know uh, we studied Scandinavian nations we studied you know Asian nations uh, yeah. and uh, and and you can talk a bit about how the personal story got in there you know I'll tell you one thing Kathy you know you may think uh, you know it's brave of him but he's very smart because he knows you're his target audience right so who else better to write the book than the target audience <laughs> and uh, and also <laughs> Well, this is, this is, most bo most books you see, especially when you when this is a call to action. I mean, it, it's not right. just a book for its own sake. It's not. But one one side, it's a reflection of some of my journey or some of my ideas. But it's also the other side. The voice is somebody who's looking out towards the future, who represents a completely different uh, uh, out outlook in society now. Correct. And Correct. also, yeah. one of the thing I realized, even when we did the oral history project, was Kathy was a very good leader and organizer. So we decided to make this book not simply one voice or even two voices, but actually involve a lot more. So I mean, it's a two-year period of research and writing. When And Kathy went out and hired these people who would have days yeah. and days of discussion. And people yeah. would pitch ideas saying that Correct. this is we like to include this, and then everybody had to they had to defend saying should we include this? What's the example you should include? Is mm -hmm. it contribute to the book? So it became more of a project, and I think that 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 really enhanced it rather than being simply one point of view. Yeah. Great. So I think the thing to sum it up is that we had you know mutual respect from the beginning, which I think is yeah. really important collaborators even when you're so different uh, and I think the second thing is just how much we you know like you said it takes a village right and we really yeah. try to be very yeah. inclusive in the process and, and the other thing that I uh, the, sorry the other thing I also know from my past talking to both of you is that when you have a difference of opinion the point is not to hold it back but to put it out there and argue it out and then come to a conclusion and you you know the, whatever you Disagree and commit, or agree and commit. But one one of the one of the themes we have in the book is about cognitive dissonance. That yes. you have the competing ideas in your mind, or competing yeah. new points of ways to do things, and it doesn't mean that you have to you have to go by one itself. I mean, both of Correct. these are continuing voices in your mind when you're making choices. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and I think that's very important because a lot of times you feel that. Oh, if I disagree, it may be rude, but you're disagreeing with the idea, not with the person. And I think to to be able to have that out there is uh, is uh, is uh, very very important. You know, in at, in my past life in Intel, Andy Grove used to say it's constructive confrontation. You know, so it's sort of it's good to put it out there. So, like what she said in terms of putting a personal side of it while you didn't have it in the beginning. Uh, and this also shows that the youth today, they're not interested in getting gyan from you, you know, getting like knowledge from you. They want to know the story. They want to know what does this mean to you? Where is this coming from? There's a value they're seeking to say, are you worthy of this message? So I want to know where this is coming from. So I think it's fantastic that, uh, you know, not only that she pushed that you felt more comfortable because we again, we feel that, this is my professional life. I'm okay sharing, but this is my personal feeling. I don't want to share, but it's really one person, you know, so it's great that all that is uh, coming through. Here is the two of you who have written the book together. Uh, you're as different as can be and still as similar as can be. I would love to know what would you like to get out of this book? What uh, actually the question is, what impact would you like to see this accomplish out in the world? I think for me, the book itself is a starting point in a conversation. I think it was an attempt to put together some of the ideas and thoughts that we've had. Uh, living life, building companies over the last few years, uh, and coming to a different set of realizations when you share it. But also, uh, we realized that this is one story. I mean, we'd love to engage with other stories and see what are the other voices out there. And I, and I think that all of us tend to believe that things don't can't change much. But uh, we have seen, even in the last few decades, that changes happen in almost every sphere of life. Mm -hmm. and, and But one of the things that hasn't changed much is how, 
how these outcomes to entrepreneurs are being are, are being created and and in fact if anything yeah. it's going in completely the wrong way so directionally we are somewhere else so to me an op- one one outcome i would like to see is more conversation about what entrepreneurs value and how sh- how should they relate to society the other thing is it's not just about entrepreneurs i think that this is that is true of every individual uh, correct who correct. is who is trying to build something who is going through life who is getting a job who is building something or whatever anybody is even at home who is thinking about how do they contribute and what and to for them to question their fundamental assumptions about how correct. when how uh, and 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 why mhm yeah yeah and i i think it, sorry i was just going to say and i think that uh, one of the points you both of you made is that your contribution or whatever can start from the beginning it's not like okay when i'm 80 when i made my money then i'll give some of the money away it's not like that i mean even if you are a student you can give yeah. something everything is dealing i think that this is a more holistic way of looking at life i mean you're you you're living life and and you have and and you recognize your family and your society around you while you're living your life it correct them this connected events correct correct yeah kathy go ahead what, what would you like to see come out yeah. of this i i think for me there's 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 two two main points uh, one is you know at, at my position in life like i come from a first generation immigrant family my families were you know both my parents were professionals and there was a lot of pressure to uh follow convention or to take less risk you know or to do things in such a way which is very important because we all need you know basic stability but i think that something that we can all do especially as young people is take time out of our life to really reflect you know and to mm-hmm. think again about what are we doing that nobody has to tell us to do and what mm-hmm. are we doing based on external pressures of invention or you know peers or social pressure uh because i think that people will realize that there's there's ways to preserve you know uh risk and and still live a very fruitful life while being yeah. more authentic and that mm-hmm. would really create a happier generation uh and the second thing i think is you know is people being i, I would love to see uh whether it's people of of, of rubby stature and background or people in the youth to really care about uh issues of inequality and issues that are facing our world right now you know this isn't something that we can wait 10 years and then mm-hmm. solve once we've all made our own plot of land etc uh mm-hmm. this is something that i think right is the very fiber of our society today so and there are multiple ways to contribute you know from just having conversations about it all the way to you know participating in some type of activism or campaign to taking a stand to you know to contributing uh whether it's income wise time wise uh so those are i think the two yeah. two results that I No I think that you know it's great you put in all these thoughts and we are always you know I think we are always looking at what are the points of inspiration to get people to think of success in a very different way you know we have gotten to a world where we think of success in only one way uh which is it is measurable and materialistic and it's important you know money is means to an end let's not uh, undermine that but that's not the end in itself and in fact as you both have pointed out and i'm sure it's written in the book is the more ways we think of sharing it the more ways it comes back to us so uh, if we can find a way to you know share what we have for the rest of the world the the best so thank you for uh, taking the years to actually write the book and it's really wonderful i think the three things i want to uh, really uh, thank you for is sharing about your personal side sharing about the collaboration which is very very important and uh, being very candid about what's not working because let's not go out into the world saying hey everything is fantastic so this is the five ways to be a great entrepreneur it's really about there is inequality and let's do something about it so thanks for bringing it up and uh, i hope we'll have another conversation a few weeks months down the line to see what's happening with the book so thank you so much thanks thank for the so time much. and if anybody wants to learn more about the book you can go yes. to www.searchfortruevalue.com uh, yeah. the book is available uh, across india will be released on may 6 and yeah. we'll definitely 
know, doing events and, and wanting to meet our readers across India. So definitely hope to see some of you guys. Thank Absolutely. You so okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. And I hope uh, all of our audience, whoever gets to watch it, enjoys the informal nature of this. It's great to just have a chit chat with you from our living room. So good to connect. Good <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.